Morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Richard Pineda, your host for the Burrell College of Osteopathic Medicine Diversity Series. And uh, today we are lucky to have uh, two very prominent women in the field of medicine in the state of Texas for our women in medicine discussion. Uh, Dr. Marissa Yates is uh, beaming into the call from Lubbock, uh, where she's on the staff of the Heart Hospital at Lubbock. Uh, and Dr. Naya Williams uh, is uh, here in El Paso, so she's beaming from a, a fairly close location to you all. Uh, and she's with the Las Palmas uh, del Sol uh, Medical Institution. Uh, welcome to you both. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks for having us. Um, so the, the theme for uh, this month, especially with International Women's Day and questions that are related to both uh, women in medicine uh, from the educational perspective, but also in the, the practitioner perspective, um, it comes from a place of educating the, the Braille students that, that are looking to this trajectory of being involved in medicine. So uh, we have picked uh, two women who um, have distinct but unique stories and they're, they're uh, both entry into medicine and, and what and how they practice now. Um, so let me start with you, uh, Marissa. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the decision that you made uh, and, and how early you made that decision to, to go into medicine? Well, uh, originally I was kind of a science nerd as a kid and um, was interested in astronomy and math and biology and um, just kind of pursued those interests separately in addition to school stuff and um, kind of discovered that I enjoyed medicine and uh, infectious disease, virology, that kind of stuff. Um, I read a book called The Coming Plague when I was in high school, maybe like an eighth grade or ninth grader. It, and now looking back, um, uh, looking at that book, I've, now I recognize the, um, the nerdiness of reading that ridiculous book in eighth grade. But um, so I just uh, kind of took a liking to it. And, and um, I had a really cool family doctor growing up. He was a really neat guy growing up in El Paso. And he took care of uh, my grandparents all the way down to us when, you know, when we were delivered and that was a really cool idea and that appealed to me. So, um, uh, I went to UTEP for undergrad and studied microbiology and then went to med school at Tech here in Lubbock before they had the four-year school in, in El Paso and, uh, thought I was going to do infectious disease and ended up falling in love with family medicine. So that's why I'm in family medicine. Fantastic. Nayo, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you came to, to medicine? Yeah. So, um, you know, I sort of look back on my life and, and think about some of the phrases my, my parents told me growing up. And I think that's really what solidified my choice. So a couple of things. My dad, when I was younger, would not allow me to say the word I can't. And like, if I said I couldn't, I would get punished. It would be from the simplest thing. Um, you know, I might've been too short to reach something. And he's like, you've got to figure out a way how you're going to do that, whether that's asking someone or not. And then my mom always had this saying of, you can be anything you want to be. You can be a doctor, a lawyer, Indian chief, whatever you want to be, you can be it. Just keep your eye on the prize. And I remember that from a really early age. Um, I remember flirting with wanting to be a geologist for a minute and then an, an astronaut. And then one day I said, no, I'm actually going to be a doctor. And this happened probably around eight years old. And I don't think at the time I, I really processed the reason why I wanted to do that. But like my grandmother was sick at that time and there were lots of things going on in my life. And so from that point forward, I said, I'm going to be a doctor no matter what. Um, you know, other people looked at me and they said, oh, no, we think you're going to be a lawyer. You know, you like to have certain arguments about different topics. Um, and I, I really just stayed the course and decided I'm going to go into medicine. And everything from that point forward actually led me to medicine. It was always in the forefront of my mind. And so I made sure that I, I was afforded certain opportunities in order to pursue medicine. And that's and why. And so uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, undergraduate and then the transition into medical school. 
Wow. Yeah. So um, I went to Bucknell University, which is in central Pennsylvania. Um, it is a liberal arts college, about 3,500 people, a predominantly white institution. And it was a huge transition for me, actually, from high school being like top of my class, number three in the class and going to Bucknell. Um, interestingly, when I got to Bucknell my first year, um, the, I met with the pre-med advisor to tell her, hey, I want to I want to go into medicine. And she sat me down and she actually flat out told me there's no way you're getting into medical school. And um, she said, you know, I'm looking sort of at your classes right now and what you're doing. And, you know, she even showed me a graph like these, this is the curve, this is who gets into medical school and this is who doesn't. Um, and she was like, I think you should do history. Like, I think you should just, you know, you did really great in your history class and that's what you should do. And I remember leaving her office and saying, oh my gosh, <laughs> all right, this is my pre-med advisor. There's only one pre-med advisor. She's essentially telling me I'm never going to medical school, even though I had worked so hard to get to this point. And in my fourth year, when I knew I needed to get a letter from her, um, I actually was in one of her classes. And she took me aside probably like midway through the class. And she said, you know, I am so surprised at what you've been able to accomplish in these four years. Um, you know, I know that we had a conversation when you first got here and you never really came back to my office. So I figured you weren't doing this anymore. Um, but I would be more than happy to write you a strong letter of recommendation. Um, so it was really a, a big turnaround from my first year there at Bucknell um, to my fourth year when I started applying for medical school. And then the transition for medical school, I was, I was sort of selective um, in the places that I thought I might be a best, a good fit for. Um, so when I was going through the books at that time, one of the thing I focused on was either that they had a, a diverse class um, or they were in a city where I felt as though I could get support. Um, and I ended up going to Robert Wood Johnson, which is actually the top diverse um, medical school in the country when it comes to diversity. So it was a really good fit for me. So Marissa, I wanna ask a question backtracking uh, and then I've, I've got some more questions for you, Nayo. So um, Marissa, you said you thought infectious disease uh, and that that was the track that you were gonna, gonna head and then you, you switched away from that. What, what happens through medical school that, that, that in, informs that change? Was it driven by a mentor? Was it driven by just sort of your uh, sense of comfort in, in the area? I mean, how did you, uh, end up making that selection for yourself? Um, I, a couple of things. The, um, I, I actually had originally pursued an MD-PhD track. I, in undergrad, when I was at UTEP, I spent a summer at UT Southwestern in a very research, bench research focused program called the SURF program. Um, and it was very isolating because it's just like you and your bench and your pipette and gels. And I love that, but it was like too much isolation. So, um, and I wasn't really sure uh, because it adds another four years. And I was already thinking about, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be 30 and uh, you know, I'll still be finishing up. Um, but uh, at the time, at, at Tech in Lubbock, the internal medicine rotation during your third year clinical clerkship is 12 weeks and it's all inpatient, which is not representative of, you know, most internist practice. Uh, and it was a not my favorite um, uh, time of my third year. The um, I understand that's gotten a little bit better. So this is not a dig at Texas Tech at all. And anyway, but um, there wasn't a lot of outpatient experience and you, and you do uh, infectious disease generally adult through, uh, you finish three years in internal medicine and then you do a fellowship in infectious disease. And I thought if I have to go three years through uh, internal medicine, I am gonna strangle myself with my stethoscope. And uh, family medicine really appealed to me. I loved um, being able to, in West Texas, because it's pretty rural, 
Um, we have a lot of graduates of our family medicine program that go out kind of into the boonies. So they have to deliver babies and they have to do those things because they're the only one around. So um, we got a pretty good training in OB and peds and stuff. And it was, it was a lot of fun. And the personalities of the people in the department were kind of like mine. We were similar and um, it appealed to me in that, in that way. So that's kind of how I uh, changed a little bit. I would like to do more research and I think family medicine has a lot of room to grow with that. Um, but we're so busy doing the work that we don't have a whole lot of time to do extra stuff. So <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, now, so, so variation of the same question is you were in medical school. Uh, did you, did you think ob right out of the gate or is that something that came to you as a result of the experience or a mentor or, or, uh, you know, how, how did you end up there? Yeah, so um, I initially thought that I wanted to be a pediatrician. I think like 35% of medical students when they think, start out think they're going to be a pediatrician. And I think that has to do a lot with the exposure that you have. You know, the doctor that you probably saw was a pediatrician you're, you know, as you're growing up. And so I loved kids. I loved babysitting and working with children. So that's really what I thought I was going to do. And when it came time to make my third year schedule, I actually said, okay, I want to get like all the hard things out of the way first. So I was like, let me do surgery, OB. And I think I wanted to do internal medicine first in the first uh, blocks as well. Um, I got my schedule and it didn't quite work out that way. Um, and I did get OB the second block. And I remember I really loved surgery. And I said, oh, wow, this is fun. But I was like, I can't see myself doing like lap appies all the time. And just sort of like Marissa said, I'm like, oh my gosh, fellowship, you know, that I'm going to be in school forever and, and training forever. And I sort of want to be done. Um, so I got to my um, pediatric rotation and it was, not exactly what I thought it was going to be. And then right following that was OB. And I remember being literally engulfed. Like my first week, <laughs> we had like this stat C-section, a medical student passed out in the OR. This woman was hemorrhaging. The attending like wasn't gowned and had to like jump on the table. And I remember the baby came out and I was on nursery that week and I was supposed to like be taking care of the baby. And I was just like marveling at what was going on um, on the OB side. And that's really what solidified for me that OB is what I want to do. And I initially also thought that I was just going to be a general OBGYN. Um, I didn't make the decision to do fellowship until literally like applications were already being accepted for fellowship. <laughs> and I said, you know what? I like this whole maternal fetal side of things the most. And so that's when I made the decision to do that as well. Um, I want to jump in a second to the second set of questions that I was talking to you all about, but I, I wanted to um, ask Naya at this particular point, um, given your experience in the region and for, for students at Braille that, that may be interested in OBGYN or in fetal, what, what are you seeing um, as significant issues on, on the medical side, things that maybe they um, want to think a little bit more about or be prepared for? I mean, are there unique um, challenges to, to fetal in the region that you're seeing? So I think it's two parts. Um, on the maternal side of things, here in El Paso, we definitely do have a higher high risk population. So thinking of obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and the effects that that have on pregnancy, um, I see that's primarily what I deal with. Um, and so really getting people linked into healthcare, because when we think about maternal health, a lot of it has to do with women I see you know, they're not seeing a primary care doctor. So their health has sort of deteriorated already. And then they find themselves pregnant. And now we're trying to support them and um, the baby at the same time. So I think that's on the maternal side. On the fetal side of things, um, you know, El Paso is really growing and we're getting a lot more subspecialist. Um, we still don't have all of the services here for such a large city that we need in terms of fetal care. So for a lot of our um, complex congenital heart disease, we have to send that out to another city. 
Um, we don't have ECMO here either. We have to send that out to another city. So there are definitely some more subspecialties that need to be in the area. When I say another city, I'm talking about, you know, we're sending them to San Antonio, Dallas, Houston. Um, so it, it's pretty far away. Um, so I think bringing some more of, more of those subspecialties that, to the area is really important. Um, and another thing for our babies, um, you know, in terms of the NICU care, the NICU care is, is pretty excellent. But when we think about maternal fetal medicine specialists for my specialty, and one of the reasons why I came here, you know, I came from cities that were smaller than El Paso, and we had like 15 MFMs for the city. Here in El Paso, we have, in my group, there's four, two, six, there's like seven. So you can just see the, the disparity that exists with that. Um, and thinking about that we already have a really high risk population. Interesting. Um, Marissa, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, sort of in the same vein, um, you know, a lot of the, the students at Braille will get um, very particular experiences in places like Gallup uh, and, and places where uh, healthcare may be a little bit more uh, disparate because of location. Um, you yourself do a lot of work in the, the rural counties or the rural areas surrounding Lubbock. Um, what are you seeing that's that's potentially unique in, in uh, rural medicine at this point? And, and is it um, are there trends or things that you're alarmed by or things that you could you could say to a you know to a medical student, hey, be thinking about this because this is going to be on the radar if you want to if you want to be uh, in in a rural area? Um, one good thing is that a lot of uh, rural towns will, if you're from a smaller place and you want to go to medical school, um, I had several classmates that were from, like Wichita Falls, Texas, Tulia, these are like West Texas kind of rural places where the city paid for their school in exchange for them agreeing to work um, work there for, it's like a four years, it's kind of like the military, it seemed to be like a year to year um, contract, but um, being a rural a physician is hard. One of my friends that graduated a few years before me in residency, um, he uh, he said he was talking about how when you're at your kid's baseball game, like you're still the doctor and you like you never get to get away. And I think that uh, kind of took a toll on him. You you get to do more, um, but funding is not great. Um, and I think access, um, like Dr. Williams was mentioning, even though you live in a moderate, I live in Lubbock right now. And so it's a moderately sized town. And, you know, um, for us, we don't have psychiatry. We don't have PD psych. We don't, I mean, we have two PD psychiatrists right now for the whole region, probably from El Paso to Abilene. Um, so access is hard. So as a primary care physician, I end up having, I am taking on a lot of things that normally you know, I'd call somebody like Dr. Williams to come and help me. Uh, so you have to um, practice uh, sometimes out, a little bit outside your comfort level. Um, and then uh, there's a flavor to rural areas. I mean, they're very tight knit, uh, which is good. I know whenever I worked in the ERs at some of these smaller places, I never had to take a social history because the nurses know who was kin to somebody and so-and-so got a divorce and that's why they're so anxious. So that part's kind of cool, but um, uh, you have to transfer a lot of stuff out. And so. Um, so in, in that case, um, and then again, I mean, I think thinking from this, thinking about this from a perspective to, to, in, in advice giving, um, would you say to, to some of these medical students that these are opportunities? I mean, could you, see yourself, had you known some of these facts, really adjusted your medical school uh, trajectory to, to focus on rural health? Or is this a function of, you may just end up in a place where this is gonna be an opportunity because, because you know, they'll, they'll filter in uh, docs from the metropolitan areas into the rural areas? Well, I, I think one of the major problems with medical education is that you can get funding from the state for medical school positions, you can even get, re you know, if you lobby hard for residency positions, but you can't make people move where they don't want to live. So, and I'm, 
I'm sure Dr. Williams can attest to this. People have an idea about Lubbock that it's a certain way. They have an idea about El Paso that's a certain way. And there's some really great things about these places that sometimes it's hard to recruit people to come to your town until they actually get in and see it. And um, because, and that's where I think medical school uh, ed, um, really will come in by recruiting people from those smaller areas because they're more likely to move back to those smaller areas because that's, that's their thing. That's where their family is. Um, I know tech, uh, we, you know, we, they actively try to recruit from, from places um, around West Texas to take care of people in West Texas. Uh, and so they admit these people that on their admissions, you know, letter, their personal statements like, oh, I love small towns, I wanna do primary care. And then they end up, you know, there's no way to go back and hold them to their personal statement. <laughs> Because we all changed, obviously, we changed our mind a few times. So I'm glad they didn't hold me to my personal statement because I'd be, you know, at USAMRED or something right now. But um, there's just no real way to, to guarantee that you're going to be able to fill the need from your student uh, body. And now, same, same question to you. I mean, is there, uh, you know, in, in pointing out the some of the gaps in terms of the, the care in El Paso, is there um, some strategic advice that you would give to a medical student to say, listen, there's an opportunity here to, to both be kind of at the, at the forefront or uh, cutting edge. I mean, is there, is there a path that you think might be, uh, might be there? Or in, in your own case, would, would that, I mean, had somebody had said to you, listen, make some adjustments in your, in your residency now or be thinking about it because this is gonna be a, a, an area where there is, um, opportunity and, and impact factor? So I think that the advice that I would give is whatever you do, you want to afford yourself as many opportunities as possible because you never know what the future is going to hold. And, and when I say that, I mean that, you know, like I mentioned before, I didn't think I wanted to do fellowship, but one of the things I did was I said, okay, I'm still gonna do X amount of research just in case I change my mind. And that was that was helpful and that was useful to me. Um, you know, even um, coming here to El Paso, I have a lot of people in my class who are like, oh my gosh, you're going to El Paso. You know, um, you're gonna be, I sort of, when I first started out, almost felt like a solo practitioner, which coming straight out of fellowship is really, really difficult. Um, but I felt confident and comfortable in my knowledge set and that I had exposed myself even in fellowship to certain things um, that in different institutions you might not have been able to do. So it's really all about being prepared for whatever may come your way. Um, you know, in obstetrics, we say you want to go to a residency that is going to prepare you to be the best OB specialist or generalist that you can be. Um, and I think that that is so true because even as a maternal fetal medicine doctor, you know, sometimes I have to do surgery and I've got to remember those skills and, and people call me in for critical things that I might not do regularly, but I know all the various ways to skin a cat. And it was because I, you know, made sure I got in with those different surgeons when they did certain cases and, and things of that nature. So it's really all about trying to give yourself the most exposure so that you're ready for anything that might be thrown your way and you can go anywhere. Um, you know, I'm not originally from El Paso. I'm from the East Coast. I was born and raised on the East Coast, went through the Northeast. Things are really different. You know, resources are really different there. And then I came here to El Paso. I'm enjoying it. Um, and I felt like because of the different things that I did, I was prepared for this type of experience. Um, so, so let me switch tax. Uh, you know, we talked about the idea that we, we wanted to also address some issues um, related to gender and and medicine, um, Baylor College of Medicine has has written extensively on the idea that uh, there is a, a high rate of attrition uh, of women in medicine. That that uh, in the initial sort of ten year cycle for careers, uh, they're they're fairly parallel. I mean, the the entrance men and women into uh, the world of medicine, and then there's this sort of drop off that happens. Um, gender disparities or disparities in pay are still evident along gender lines, uh, more so in the medical field than quite frankly, a lot of other fields. Um, uh, and now, since, since I have you the, the, uh, from this last question, let me ask you this. Um, in terms of your experience, is there um, 
a sense of, of how you have been able to maneuver through these potential uh, landmines or is there uh, some insight that you that you garnered in your time uh, in the medical profession to either deal with some of these issues head on or, or maybe to frame your experience so that um, uh, women that are in, in this class at, at Burrell can uh, maybe have some insight going into it? Yeah, that, that's that's a really um, complex question. And I think I'll take it from just a, a couple of different angles. Um, so one of the things that I know for me that, you know, it's always on the forefront of my mind that not only am I a woman, but I'm also a Black woman and what comes with that and, you know, what people notice when they first see me and how people might perceive who I am. And so, you know, we, we always hear things, you know, oh, you've got to make sure that you're doing the best, that you're, you're doing more than others in order for you to be looked at as an equal. Um, so I think that's definitely a running theme that has always gone through my head um, as I approach different interactions with people, as I approach different um, opportunities. And then specifically in obstetrics and gynecology, you know, there's really been a shift over the past like 25 years. So OBGYN used to be predominantly a male dominated field. You know, it is a surgical subspecialty. Um, and now you're seeing that when we talk about match rates, like 80% of females are going into obstetrics and gynecology. Yet, when we think about the leadership um, at you know, the divisional levels, the chairships, those are still predominantly head by males. Um, and it, it makes for a very interesting dynamic, um, especially when you're dealing with a patient population who are all female, obviously, um, for the most part, and that uh, experiences are different. Um, you know, a lot of females will state, hey, I want another female to be my provider. Um, but then when it comes to expert advice, even with patients, sometimes they feel as though, well, the male has the expert advice, even though I love my female provider who's taking care of me. Um, so some of the things that, you know, I, I personally have done is I sort, I think the, the key is really to find your, your niche and find the thing that you're really passionate about and then move that forward. So one of my things has always been patient safety um, on the labor and delivery suite and making sure that we're following evidence-based practices. And so I really became a champion of that. And I think that once people see that you're a champion of something and that you're really committed and dedicated, then you're able to, you know, if you wanna move the ladder that you can move that ladder. Um, in terms of personally, it's definitely really difficult. Um, you know, I, I always think back of, 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 um, even when I was in residency and I didn't realize like my husband felt like he wasn't married. <laughs> like that's what, that's how he felt. And, and for women, because I, I think there's all these notions of what women should be doing in the household and even outside of the household. It, that's another added pressure and stress personally on you as well. And so you just really have to be strong and you have to say, well, this is the way that I see my life. This is the way that I see our life and being um, committed to that. And there's nothing wrong. The other, there's nothing wrong with deciding 10 years from now, oh, I'm going to shift right? I just think it's important that you're not shifting because someone else told you or because, you know, something happened to you, but you've made that conscious decision because you feel as though that's what's going to be best for you and your life and your family. Uh, Marissa, I want to ask a, a variation of that, of that question. Um, data that had been collected by the National Science Foundation a couple of years ago um, evaluated uh, success of female academics, but but there's a clear corollary between uh, that and women in medicine. Um, so when it came to men who were approaching the decision to um, have families and have kids, the the general consensus was, uh, you know, what 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 uh, they were they were praised, right? It was conceived as like this the strong male and they're balancing all this sort of stuff out. But when women were put in that same formula, uh, they were perceived as being selfish and not contributing to the institution or not being part of uh, the bigger process. From, from your perspective uh, and, and raising children, how have you 
dealt with that? Have you seen that? I mean, have you had that that sense of experience? And and if not, what what's your sense of of how to advise uh, folks to get get past some of those kinds of challenges? Um, well, first, I'd say that I think probably any professional female deals with that to some degree. Um, and in medicine, there's a lot of sacrifice. You sacrifice a lot of time away. You, there's a lot of things that you miss because you're training or taking care of patients. And so it's really important for you to love what it is that you do. And I would just echo what the wise words of Dr. Williams, like if you need to have a passion and a niche and love it because it, it will feel very not worth it if you get to where it is and you don't love it. Also, it makes it more difficult to get through. Medicine is very hierarchical. I don't, I don't know that in every academic uh, field it's like that. It, I think there are some flavors of that in most, um, most academic departments. But um, when I first got out into practice, I, <clears throat> I had two male partners. And um, I had never even had, other than my research jobs, I never had like a job job, you know, like where I worked in an office or anything. And so um, I was always made to feel like the expectation was that I, you know, worked like they did. And they both have housewives that don't work. They're stay-at-home moms. I don't have a housewife. I tease my husband about it sometimes. And he jokes that he carries my stethoscope, but... Um, I got pregnant during my third year of medical school um, and had a baby and was able to save all my time off during fourth year and took some leave with my oldest, who's now 16. Um, and, but you, uh, it helped a lot having a partner who was supportive. And e even, I mean, you just can't know what it's like until you get into it, really. So it really helps to have that external support. But um, I think definitely you're, you run up against that. You have male chairs and, and, and other people that will expect you to work for two weeks with no days off, which I did for uh, several years until my husband finally was like, listen, you can't keep doing this. So, and I think setting healthy boundaries is, is essential, which is unfortunately something I learned later rather than earlier. So listen to your older female um, wise wise women that are, have been in medicine and can uh, teach you some things so you don't have to learn those things the hard way. Do you, do you find that uh, building that network, um, was that easy? I mean, in, in terms of connecting with um, female colleagues. I mean, because there's also then then this question, we've, we've talked about this the entirety of the diversity series, right? Which is, um, you, you may be something, right? You may be a woman, but does that mean that you have to then turn to, to women for your support structure? You may be uh, uh, LGBT, but does that mean you've got to turn to that structure? And, and so there's natural inclination to say, well, yes, because some of those experiences are very clearly the same. But I mean, how how do you maneuver? I mean, in some ways, when you're in in when you're still in the educational system as a medical student, um, the mentoring structure would be a little bit more clear, right? And and certainly um, as the Burrell students are working with their preceptors, there's a there's definite structure there. But then you get an out out as you suggest into the job, and all of a sudden you're like, okay, now you know, like um, my ship is out to sea. Um, what what do I do? How, how did how did you do that, Marissa? Like, how did you build that network and and is it is it what are the landmines in trying to find that support structure that's professional in in so much as it's part of that medical world or did you go entirely outside of that and look for people that were in different professional structures um i didn't really have a whole lot of mentorship to be honest and and, and that's something that i wish that i had um the like like Dr. Williams said, the department chair, my residency coordinator, most of the family medicine residents were males. There was one other female in my class, my year, and we're still good friends. And, and that was my, that was our support, you know, and we're so busy. I don't think that we communicate with each other um, as much as I think would be healthy, you know, just having, being able to let off some steam. Um, but um, it, I certainly, I think it helps to have somebody that looks like you and that can speak to what your experience might be like, but you may not find somebody exactly like you. 
Um, and frankly, I, I just don't think a lot of the male physicians can speak to the same. It's almost an unspoken expectation for you to perform like a single male physician, resident, med student, whatever. So I think um, it's getting some better though. It's yeah. just, it's slow. Uh, Nayo, same, same question. I mean, how, how have you built that, that network and, um, you know, is it something that, that uh, sh should be a network of people that are, that are in exact same circumstances and straits? Have you, have you sought a network uh, of folks that are outside of medicine? I mean, how have you found balance in, in, in your professional trajectory? Right. Um, so to echo what Marissa said, I also feel as though I, I haven't had all of the mentorship that I would like. I, I've been to courses talking about being a mentor, being a mentee, and what that relationship looks like. Um, and I have found it to be a little bit difficult um, in terms of uh, thinking about the people that I have latched on to. I think, once again, because my specialty for those who have the power, a lot of them are not females. Um, in my career, it has been other males who have been in my specialty. Um, I think one of the great things though that you can do is, you know, be a part of an organization um, when you're in med starting from medical school. So, you know, I think about the fact that I was part of the um, American Women in Medicine Association as well as um, SMN. Uh, S Na Student National Medical Association. And so the friendships that I built there and then went to national conferences, now granted pandemic times a little different, but going to those national conferences, meeting other people from around the country and then having those type of connections um, was also very useful. And as I think about right now where I am in my life, you know, one of the things I'll, I'll, I'll say is that sometimes even now I get afraid to like ask people certain things. Um, it's like, oh my gosh, I haven't talked to them in like two years. Are they going to be like, why are you trying to reach out to me? And I will tell you this, that everyone is super happy and excited to help if they can. So I recently reached out to one of my mentors from my first year of fellowship, um, who he had actually left and gone to another position while I was there and he ran across my mind and so I shot him a text and you know he was really eager to hear from me he said oh yeah definitely let me help you with this let me help you with that so if anything don't be afraid because I think it's better to try than not to try and I think people come in and out of your lives for different reasons I mean the reason why I'm in maternal fetal medicine is because there was an MFM who saw something in me and said hey, I think you should do this. And I was like, really? I never thought about that. Um, and I thought about it and I was like, actually, he's right. Like, this is what I should do. And so I went forward with it. So mentorship is great. You should have mentors. They're wonderful. Um, but sometimes it is hard. It's hard. Um, and it is more comfortable sometimes finding a mentor that, you know, reflects who you are, but I have definitely had mentors who are the complete opposite of me, and it's still been a good experience, and they've given me what I've needed at that moment in time. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, I, I want to remind uh, the folks that are that are uh, in on our call today that uh, you can put questions into uh, the chat, um, and I can filter those to uh, the, those questions to our two guests. Um, <clears throat> one of the other questions, Marissa, I want to start with you on this question. Um, this has come up actually a surprising amount in the in these diversity conversations. Uh, the docs that we've talked to have talked about the financial prospects of of being in medicine, and um, I know that you have set of a practice and you have worked with groups and you have been in a variety of different economic positions in medicine. So, so the question for you, Marissa, is um, what, what have been the valuable lessons or, or is there a valuable lesson that jumps out about the financial side of what you have to do uh, in, in terms of channeling the success or the opportunities that you have? Because I think that's something that, again, is not talked a lot about during medical school, but, but again, you will end up uh, on the ship out to sea and suddenly think, you know, I don't, I don't have a financial plan here or a, a structure. So, so can you give us some insight into that? Um, well, I've, I've, I guess had the, 
I don't know if you would call it privilege, but I've, I've worked in, some, in a few different types of practices. I, um, when I first got out of school, I was recruited by the county hospital who, it was like a semi-employed agreement where um, uh, myself and my two partners, we were responsible for the practice. We um, paid all the bills divided by three and then any profits came to us divided by three based on our charters and stuff. And so I was really plugged into, and um, in this way, the my partners were helpful in educating me about coding and billing and reimbursement and all that stuff, which um, in med school, they teach you the medicine really well. I mean, you really probably pretty much wherever you go, you'll get the medicine part because we all have to take licensing exams. Um, they really don't teach you about how to have a life in medicine. Um, and they don't teach you how to make money in medicine. And so that's where having some uh, residents that finish before you that can tell you, hey, this is how I, you know, looked at these contracts and this is what you need to ask for and this is what you need to watch out for uh, can be very helpful. Um, and I have since moved to a, a, a more like a salaried position with a, a bonus structure um, that has a little bit more of a safety net for me for right now, which I like, and it allows me to have a little bit more time off, which I need um, so that I can be around my kids and see them and so that people don't think I'm imaginary. Um, uh, but it coming here, it helps me to know those things that I learned when I was in more private practice. Um, because the financial piece is very important. Um, you can't help anybody if you go broke. So you have to know how to um, maximize, you know, and charge and do all that stuff appropriately. And so that, that has been helpful um, to learn. Uh, Nayo, same same question for you as you've uh, embarked on your particular particular trajectory and and I mean you know for example even even figuring out what your contract is like with the hospital and figuring out what you um, can can ask for or should ask for or shouldn't ask for or, or those kinds of things uh, what 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 lessons can you share with us or maybe insight into how how you figured some of those things out. Yeah, so it, it's it's definitely really complicated, um, and we're not taught this. You you just don't know when you come out what to expect, and there's so many different um, compensation methods that it's not a one size fits all kind of thing. So my first advice would be get a lawyer, get a contract lawyer who does medical contracts to review your contract. Yes, it might cost you a thousand dollars, but it is going to be well worth it. Um, the next thing is nothing beats a failure, but a try. So aim high and then, you know, see what sticks because at the end of the day, who's ever giving you a contract, they're not really worried about you. They're just worried about themselves. So they're never giving you the best offer. Like just know flat out, you are never getting the best offer when you get a contract. Okay. Um, so, and, and that's taken in my, in my short time here, I, for some reason have gotten a lot of contracts for various different things and I'm like reading through and I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, um, but I have sort of developed the strength now more so to ask certain questions, um, and just see what they say. Cause you don't know what they're going to say. Um, then the, Next thing I would say is, you know, a lot of a lot of students are going to come out of medical school with a lot of debt. OK, myself included. Um, I initially was on sort of the public service loan forgiveness track and now I'm sort of off that track. But don't let your loan stress you out, because at the end of the day, even if it takes you 25 years, your loans will get paid. And that's OK. There's a lot of other aspects to life. And I think having financial literacy just for your own personal well-being is really important. I'm really lucky. My husband's an accountant. He's really into finances. So I'm like, hey, you take care of that. You know, he starts like yapping at me, all these different things. I'm like, OK, fine. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, but you want to make sure that you set yourself up. And so I've always been sort of had the motto that, you know, if I can use my money right now to make more money and continue paying off my loans, 
that's fine. Like you don't have to rush and do all of that and feel as though it's a weight because you will at least make enough money to pay off your loans. Um, and then my last sort of, let's see, piece of advice. I remember, um, being a third year medical student in my surgery preceptor, I was with him for four weeks and he kept talking about these RVUs. And he was like, Nayo, if you learn anything from me, learn about RVUs. And I was like, aren't I supposed to be learning about surgery? Like, why are you telling me about these RVUs? But let me tell you, when you get out into the real world, these RVUs are really important. And I realized he told me valuable information that I don't remember, but I wish I had. And it's okay because now I know. So just like, it's going to be overwhelming. Get a lawyer, ask, protect yourself, and don't worry about your debt because it's going to get paid. That's my words of advice. <laughs> uh, that's good. That's, that's very good. Um, let, me, let me carry on with you now. Um, one, of the, one of the things that, that uh, had come up in this Baylor College of Medicine report was the idea that there's uh, uh, uneven transitions for, for doctors in general to, to move into leadership positions in the hospital, that, that there's always CMO positions, but that's the, that's the wall, right? That they're very rarely CEOs because the, especially the large corporations want an MBA or want somebody that has that medical experience. Um, wh what, is your, what is your sense of trajectory for yourself in terms of leadership? Is that something that you see yourself wanting to do to be uh, an administrator at that higher level? Or do you think that that's, um, well, that, I guess that's the question. Do you, is that a is that the trajectory, or is that part of the trajectory you'd like to see yourself on? Right. Um, so I have always been really actively involved in a lot of different organizations. I've always had leadership roles from you know eighth grade onwards, and um, that's something that's interested me. Since being here in El Paso, I have been promoted to the maternal medical director for our labor and delivery suite at um, Del Sol. And that was something that I really wanted. Um, I thought that it was important for me. And, you know, once again, hearkening back to what I mentioned before, just making sure that you sort of grab hold of all of the opportunities that are given to you and what you're going to do with those opportunities and realize when, you know, okay, I have, this has served its purpose and now it's time for me to move on. Um, when I sort of think about my own trajectory, um, it's, it's, it's sort of hard because I love taking care of patients, right? Like that's why I got into medicine when patients are crying in my office, but then telling me, you know, I'm so happy that you're my doctor and that you're taking care of me and my baby. That's what makes me continue and go on. And those are the experiences that I love the most. And the more administrative stuff I do, the more I'm sort of pulled away from that. Um, and so I've sort of had to rebalance a little bit and figure out, you know, what is it that I really want? And I, and I think what I'm realizing is that, you know, we, we talk about five-year, 10-year, 15-year plans, you know, um, and for this beginning part of my career, I really like these patient interactions, um, but that we live in a world where we can really mold our schedule and what we want to do on our own terms. I think more so than what we were able to do even five or 10 years ago. Um, so for me, I'm starting to think about, well, what can I do personally for myself um, and be still a leader, be in charge of myself and my own trajectory, um, but still having an impact on patients, as well as thinking about policy and different management. So for myself, I've always wanted to, I come, I come from a family, my, my father um, immigrated here from Jamaica when he was a teenager. And just thinking about, you know, the West Indies in general does not have very good maternal health care. And what can I do for, you know, that aspect of things having sort of farther reach. And I feel like it's hard to do everything all at once. Um, so I, I think for myself, I, I've decided I have to sort of focus like in five year sort of like trunks um, in so that I can do everything that I wanna do, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, Marissa, a variation of that same question for you. Um, the, the leadership prospects, I mean, the, the things that you uh, might want to do on your trajectory, do you see yourself moving into um, a, a different kind 
uh, of leadership position uh, in, in the the system, or do you do you find yourself torn in the in the same way that that Nio is in terms of saying I I, I want to be on the ground and in the trench as opposed to sort of sort of above uh, above that? Um, I have I have considered things you know moving in different directions before, but um, like Dr. Williams said the what recharges my batteries is the patient interactions. And so, um, and uh, just like Dr. Wayne said, anything you do that, it's really hard to be a part-time physician. It really is um, because there's always a pull to see more people and more, and it's hard to say no, or I, I'll just say that I'm not very good at saying no. Um, and it ends up, uh, biting me later on when I don't say no. So um, within our, our hospital, there's always opportunities. One of the things that I really like about the, the group that I'm with right now is that the uh, people that make the decisions are all physicians. Where I worked at before, there was a board of physicians that only had purview over clinical matters. And unfortunately, that means they're there's very little physician input in administrative decisions, the big things that actually affect you. Um, and so certainly I would, you know, be happy to, to serve in any of those positions. Um, I, everybody kind of takes turns being on the board there. So, um, which is good, it gives everybody an opportunity to have their voice heard. And they're, where I work at, they're very responsive right now. Uh, but I would like to do more research. I, I, that's one thing that I would like to do a little bit more with all my spare time that I don't have, but I have dreams <laughs> of getting back in the lab at some point. But. Um, we have a, a question that's addressed to, to both of you. And I think this is uh, probably probably the sort of core question, probably also the unicorn question, but, but the question is, um, what does work-life balance uh, really look like? And is, is it achievable on a daily scale? Is it more like a weekly or monthly scale? Or is it quite frankly, just something that we like to toss around without any real uh, kind, of, kind of solution to? So, so Marissa, you're, you're still on the screen. Let me ask, ask you that and then, uh, and then Nayo. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the holy grail of any professional professional person and especially professional woman if you're, um, in a, in a relationship and if you have kids, um, we tend to be fairly driven people or we wouldn't be in medicine in the first place, I don't think. And so we, we certainly want to be good at what we are doing. And so trying to be the best wife and the best mom and the best physician at, all at the same time is, it really feels impossible. So I sort of circulate, you know, I'm like, I have to focus on more so on my work, you know, at certain times of the week or year or whatever. And then, you know, then my kids need, need me more. And so I have to be able to be flexible. There are only a certain number of hours in the day and to keep from getting burned out. Um, it helps to have a partner uh, or a mentor or somebody that can say, hey, you seem kind of kind of overstretched, maybe back off a little bit. And uh, that's been helpful. Uh, to have somebody around you that cares about you that'll say, hey, you're getting a little bit too, too much, too much here, maybe back off a little bit. So that's important. Yeah. Uh, Naya? Um, I, I completely agree with what Marissa says, you know, in terms of having that support person, you know, your partner, your spouse, whoever it is, um, is really, I think, one of the, the key things because they're going to see things that sometimes you don't always see. But in terms of work-life balance, so um, I like to say, and, and I learned this through maternal fetal medicine, believe it or not, a, a first year fellows conference, that it's really work-life harmony, because if you balance, something is always going to give out over another. And so it's really trying to create that harmony for yourself um, with work and life. And it is hard. It is an ongoing process. Um, we're always learning new things and, and, and just like Marissa said, you know, like when we're dealing with patients, we want to be all in like, this is patients have entrusted their lives in our hands. Right. So when we're with them, we have to be all in because it could be a life or death situation. Right. 
Um, but still being able to say, okay, looking at things and saying, this is not working. I have to somehow make a change. And you're the only person who can advocate for yourself in the workplace, stating that there needs to be a change, um, that this right now is, is not tolerable. I can't keep leaving at six, seven, eight o'clock at night, every night. Like it's just, it, it's just not going to work. And what can we do to try to make it work? And then also then knowing like when you have to just say, all right, well, if it's not going to work, I need to move on. I need to move on to something else for my own mental health, for my family's well-being, whatever the case is, and realize that making that decision doesn't mean that you're a failure. It means that you are protecting yourself and your family. And, you know, at the end of the day, our jobs, if something, if we drop dead tomorrow, they're going to say, oh my gosh, we miss you so much, but they're going to move on and they're going to find someone else right? It's not their, it's not their job to protect you. It's your job to protect you. So just always remember that. Fantastic. Well, uh, Dr. Mercy Yates, Dr. Naya Williams, thank you for spending an hour with us for the diversity conversation. The insights are fantastic. And uh, I think there was a lot to be gleaned and, and uh, we certainly appreciate that. For uh, our viewers, uh, we will be back next month with uh, another diversity uh, conversation. We're getting uh, closer and closer, hopefully, to, to having these in person or to having these uh, at least in the same space. So uh, with that, uh, thank you both very much. And uh, thanks to our audience. And uh, we'll see you again soon.